Hey, this is O'Teal. If you're liking what you're hearing, head on over to patreon.com forward slash comes a time pod and get your bus pass for an extra episode every week. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Comes a Time. I'm Mike Fenoya. I'm O'Teal. How you doing? It's nice to see you, my friend. I know, man. That was fun. Um, it's like catching up with old friends. Yeah. It is catching up with old friends. <laughs> we had Jeff Comente on, and uh, he has a new look. Yeah. Like Five o'clock shadow no longer. He's uh, 10 a.m. clean. It was nice to, uh, yeah, you know what's funny too, man? Because it's like, you actually are old friends with him. And I feel like I am because I spend so much damn time with you guys. He remembered you from the comedy club. I tried very hard not to bother him. <laughs> and uh, he was doing the, the dead, I forget what it was called, but it was like down on Mineta in the West Village, right around the corner from the cellar. He was yeah. doing his uh, maybe Crimson White. and I forget the name of it, but it was like a a show. And I was working at the cellar, and he walks in and sits down and eats. And I don't want to bother anybody ever. And I'm, you know, but it was like a very, like, uh, not busy weeknight in the restaurant. And I just went over and was like, hey, dude, I'm not going to bug you. I'm a comic here, but just want to say, like, thanks for everything. And, you know, and he was like, cool, man, thanks, you know. And then I guess I'm walking away. I was like, oh, I want to go talk to him so bad. <laughs> but I just left him alone. Cause, but yeah, no, we just bullshitted for a couple minutes. And yeah, he's great. He's the best. This was such a refreshing chat. I know. It made me really want to get out and play with Ted and Co. again. Because that just brings back memory. You know, when we start talking about the music, and then I just, like, remember how he approaches Lost Sailor Saint, you know? And it's like, oh, that's, I can't wait to play that one again, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, he, like you, he's one of those guys that, like, you could just, when you're, when you just can trust it's like as a fan it's like you just trust fall into the music and you know it's going to be like handled with care and it's going to be like the segs are going to be perfect and the fun you know it's just like you know he's got it airtight you yeah. know what i mean i feel it's the same way from our end too because you really with this crowd it's probably the best it could ever be put is like you could really trust fall yeah into the music with this crowd because Absolutely. they they're gonna they got you. We got you your can, back. You got ours. <laughs> you could you could totally blow it, and then they'll cheer for you. <laughs> Better luck next time. Better luck next time. <laughs> we're we're our dude. We're all a bunch of supportive moms, and you guys are all little league baseball players. That's right. That's, that's the scene. A, that's my boy. <laughs> we got some orange slices if you're hungry. <laughs> Well, anyway, Jeff, you're the best. Thank you for hanging with us. And everyone who's yeah, listening, man. thank you. Um, we can trust fall with this podcast into your ears. So thank you for giving us that. You yes. you mothers, you. Um, you're, listen, you're listening to this on Osiris, home to many amazing brother and sister podcasts. So check them all out at OsirisPod.com. And if you want to get weird and deep, head over to uh, Patreon dot com slash comes a time pod and join us on the bus for a bunch of extra bonus content and uh we'll catch you over there enjoy jeff see you next week but it's good to see your face brother yeah you too man sure missed the hell out of you same here i tell you what it looks like the pandemic's treating you well you, have you been uh, golfing? You know, uh, not as much as I would like to, you know. It's, it's been weird. Just, uh, you know, between home stuff and it just seems like stuff, like schedule fly, flying by, you know, so. <clears throat> Are you a golfer? Just, that's, that's what you you like to get uh, out? Oh, well, yeah, I, I, I play golf. I'm not, <laughs> it hasn't been great as of late, but. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's one of the, th I was surprised to learn. I have a friend who, who was a golfer and he got, he, pretty much played throughout most of the the pandemic up in the east coast like when the courses were open because you're socially yeah. distant I mean, golf is actually walk. one of, it's actually one of the easiest things to, to uh socially distance so and especially if you you know if you're a member of a private club or whatever it makes it even easier but i mean our club was like they didn't open until i want to say it was like early may so there was definitely oh, wow. like you know it was definitely a couple of months there where it was shut down and when they did open up it was like really strict i mean it still is right now everything's tea times and it's you know but it's uh you know, 
but most people are at the club are vaccinated and stuff like that. So yeah. it's working out and, you know, you stay away from my moves and I'm in the same bubble, you know, basically that's so my life has been one big bubble. <laughs> you know, <laughs> a handful of people. Yeah. I thought you would be living on the golf course. No, I, I should have been, but no, I was uh, actually with the tea time thing. And all of a sudden it was like, it, everybody wants to play because nobody had to go to work. So it was like impossible to get tea times. So, oh, so that also kind of like hosed you out of it too, but it's a lot of good. rookies, yeah. a lot of rookies out there taking mulligans. That's all right, you know. <laughs> you You've been running? playing too. I've been seeing you playing. Uh, well, yeah, it was, uh, started with the uh, you know been going up to TRI Studios there with Bob and Wolf Brothers. So yeah, uh, that just started off with kind of like getting together, I guess, like you know, and every so often. Then it became every other weekend. That's kind of what are, where it's been now. Um, then started the live streams, and so things are moving. <laughs> That's it's nice to like actually play with you know friends and real people, yeah. and, you know. Yes, I mean watching the live streams. I want to ask you because that was a, you know, as someone at home dying for live music, we had the chance to you know Trey did his thing and watching you guys do your thing, and it's uh, funny to watch the reaction of uh, musicians, Bobby, um, and Trey, and all of that. Everyone has their unique kind of like, oh shit, like. We can't hear you. You can't hear us. There's a delay, <laughs> like that whole thing. It's a little bit of a strange, you know, thing to to kind of adapt to quickly, huh? Yeah. Well, I went from uh, like for the first one that was like literally there must have been like a 35 second delay. Yeah. So like we'd wow. be into the next song, all of a sudden you're seeing people like cheering and stuff, and it was going, oh boy, that's this is that's strange, you know. And but they've got it down just like to a couple of milliseconds now, and we can actually uh, there's interaction, so you can. We can, uh, they'll unmute certain amounts of audience members and you can talk with them or whatever, or, you know, and, and talk back and forth. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely, uh, it's improved in that. We're learning as we're going along, but it's actually, like I said, it's been a lot of fun and sounds good. And, um, you know, just, you know, we do have a Zoom wall in front of us. So we're seeing, you know, hundreds of people at one time. Yeah. <clears throat> I remember so, one of the first ones, Bobby goes, raise your hand. And it's like <laughs> he tunes his guitar, walks away, comes back, and then he starts seeing hands go up. And it's yep. like, oh, that's got to be frustrating. It was, it, was a, it was a little strange <laughs> on that. But. Oh, man. It's, it's so crazy seeing your face like this, dude. I'm sorry. I'm tripping out. Was uh, this yeah, Moe's yeah. idea or your idea? Oh, this is strictly mine. Yeah. All right. You know, and it was just like, and it's also it's, it's getting more and more gray. And I was just going like, hmm, you know what? I was just like, uh, hmm. Just get rid of this thing for a while, see what it's like. Yeah. And maybe this, maybe this will stick. Maybe it won't. I don't know. It's still me. So, so if it was all silver, you'd be cool with it. Maybe. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just like I mean, for some reason, like here, like it just wants to stay black here, for, except for like a couple yeah, of hairs. Dude, I know. But then it starts, sucks. To, you know, it's, it's little blotches of black, and it just started looking like I was like. Eh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe i'll just wait we'll see yeah Mine's, it looks like it's yeah it's it bad. looks patchy it's weird like i i grow a nice thick beard but it gets very like salt and pepper and red in yeah, there too it. <laughs> and it looks it looks like you remember those billy bully thing or whatever it was where like you drag the <laughs> magnet you remember oh, yeah. that dump oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Remember that remember cheap that. toyo teal where it was like this face and <laughs> yeah. you with the red pen would magnet up hair that's exactly. what i would look like all well, so yeah, I, I hate shaving. shaving but i have to because it looks stupid <laughs> I, I grew my hair for a minute during the pandemic to see where it would grow. <laughs> and I look like I look like Danny DeVito in Taxi. He never <laughs> let me see that. This no the first hell no, dude. Of it. <laughs> oh, no way, dude. No way. We've been on the phone like every day, like all of but like what, three days or something. <laughs> it's I know, the right? first time hearing of it. I didn't want to tell you. I get one <laughs> string of hair right here that grows. Like if I were to let it grow, I have one like. You get the, the Homer Simpson going. I Get the curtain, yeah, totally. Oh my goodness! And I, had, I, and I hadn't seen my face in over twenty-five years, so I figured, man, see what it looks like, you know. I mean, I think I've seen you with short hair, but not a no, clean I don't, face. I've never seen you with short hair. I mean, this was a this was a picture from way back that I came up, and I didn't know it was you at first, and I was like, oh, well, then maybe maybe so. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like early, I think super early rat dog, maybe. Uh, but I, I never had short hair then. It was uh, my, my probably my shortest hair would have been like 
physical pictures would have been back into like the, the, the later eighties. Cause at that point I started growing it, but there was always that fucked up point in part of my friendship. That's like, <laughs> you know, where, you're, you're, where you're in the, where you're in the middle of it, you know, and you got to just get past that shitty point to where the length goes, you know, until I can actually put it into a ponytail. And once, once I, once I hit that point, I never, you know, then I've never, I've never been without the long hair. I love it, man. If it were to, if it were to start to thin, would you ever consider buzzing it or would you let it kind of no that's a good question but it's uh i think i'm gonna be okay it's um i think you're you know, all right yeah it does. If, it looks... if it's not going by now i think it's gonna... <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> i got my point. my father's side of the uh family genes there actually my mother's side was also very hair healthy i should say my father's actually my grandfather on my father's side was balding so it was um i got my mother's side i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> That's lucky people. Lucky people. Oh man, he's my, you know he's my brother. He's got natural. His hair is like naturally curly, so it's like you know, it's huge, and so it's like uh, he's got it too. So I'm, I'm, I'm fingers crossed, but I just go with the flow. It's like you know the color, whatever you know started kind of early on. Um, just what it is. So I'm you got lucky. It's- I wish my if mine if this would just go silver, I'd be so psyched. But it's all blotchy and whatever so i think my oh wife boo-hoo. Can't go. you Continue know what i don't want to hear it oteal boo I, I have a bald spot back here i grew a big fro out <laughs> one year and it was right it uh when jess got pregnant and you know my it was out there you know my hair curls up and then there was just just one patch back here where you could always see my scalp the hair would just like curl away probably a know? couple more than a bald spot yeah it wasn't really a bald spot but it looked like you know she was like that's i don't know i think she just didn't like my long my fro <laughs> I, I, well, actually, uh, <clears throat> cuz um like when i mean obviously we, uh, we had you know known each other a little bit when we were touring with rat dog almond brothers or whatever and but I hadn't seen you. I think the next time I saw you was on Jam Cruise, probably about the time. Uh, yeah. When Jess was pregnant. You had, you had the, you know, it was beautiful hair, man. I thought, like, he's like, wow, it's great, man. So <laughs> oh, you always got shows. options. Yeah. Well, we'll see. It's, it's uh, a ball spot shows up. Now it's a line. It's weird. It's uh, I think it's more like cow, a cow lick than a, yeah, you know, yeah. a ball I think you're, you know, I think you're I, okay. I, I got one too where my back of my hair might, it might just <laughs> separate where it's like, damn it. I'll take my, a picture of it after after the because uh, this is the perfect length right now where I could show you. <laughs> my only option now is to grow like the Fraser Crane, where it's like back here, and oh, I just yeah, wear a baseball go. hat constantly, and I just got that that neck roll of of curls. I can't, but I it's applaud too- you for for just shaving it though, because I remember when like white guys were just <clears> not do it they would just try and it's like dude it's come on you know black I had guys that just shave their head in a minute but now it's not better. a thing anymore now everybody the, the can shave do head that. looks great you know it I, does. Had such, I, mean, I had you such th- it. i had such thick beautiful hair and uh it went away i shaved my head once and then when it was growing back this started to go first I had the receding hairline and I did the whole like cut it short and, and then I'm like, whatever. And I shaved my head. And the first time I shaved it, I had the worst stomach ache because I knew that like, this was it. There's no turning back now. Like this is the, you know, yeah. and in well, the world I live tan, in, you know, there's, there's that point too, or is, you know, right. So you, yeah, that probably totally. should only take like a week or so if you're out in the sun, but it's, <laughs> yeah, uh, dude, it's pasty at first. Yeah. Oh, it's awful. Me, the winter. I like, well, shaved my beard, you know, I had the old plucked chicken thing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just pink yeah totally okay what 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 face did moe make that's what i want to know what was her first face i mean of course she was supportive of it and then she's like well can't she just like just grow a little, a little small little mustache and, like, you grow know, a little like, zappa you know grow a little frank she used to like you know because i used to trim it down or whatever but it was such a pain in the ass to, you know to try to get the line straight so i was like you know what I just, i'm not doing this anymore i'm just <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I wanted to talk to you about when we some of those old rat dog days because it's I wish that I had spent more time with you hanging out when Rat Dog and Almond Brothers were together because that yeah, was a long too. time ago. I know, but it's just you know how the, you know, how things go. The camps get separated in a sense or whatever Absolutely. timings and all that stuff, and you know it's just. Uh, but it's all um, the way I look at it. It's all come together how it should have. And here we are. Absolutely. But you yes. came in through like. A jazz way, right? Because, uh, well, first of all, even before that, you're you're born and raised in San Francisco, right? Yes. 
And how did you first even get into jazz? Were you into rock and roll first or something else first? Or was jazz um, first? Or? <clears throat> I mean, just by starting basically by ear from probably their earliest conscious memories of about four, you know, when I was able, I just started and you know, I was able to play with two hands and I was, I was brought up in a Catholic household and so I was being drugged to church. Then when I came back after, you know, I'd hear the organist and I would just go home and I would mimic what I heard the organist play. So that's wow. kind of how it all started, like where I was like, had a conscious like, oh, because the piano was in the house, but it was like, oh, I could figure this out. Okay, and cool, you know? And so I went uh, a few years of that. And then I remember like my sister, like probably I was about six or something like that. She bought me this Elton John's greatest hits book of public published uh, piano music. And oh, I couldn't yeah. read a thing on it, so I had no idea. I mean, I could play the songs just by ear, um, but I didn't, but then I started looking at it to realize, okay, well, if I'm playing this, this must be that. And, you know, and I started to figure a little bit, but I started uh, taking private lessons about seven. And so from that point, study with, um, it was actually a friend of my sister's from high school. It was, she was quite a good pianist. And, um, but I think I studied with her for about a year or so. And then she turned me on to, a, 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 I guess, she put it a much higher level um, teacher. She said I outgrew her <laughs> pretty fast. <laughs> So I went right into like, you know, heavy classical world. Um, so I, I was listening to a lot of classical music from like seven on, but at the same time, like listening to my brother's rock and roll records, you know, so, yeah, you know, nice. so I had all that going. I started fiddling the guitar a little bit, but um, so fast forward up until, um, I guess maybe I also had a, I had a passion for ragtime music because it kind of has, that was like kind of a transition into what I think transition uh, into jazz as far as harmonica. how did that happen? I just heard some some Joplin. And I was like, going, oh, I want to play some of that, you know. Yeah. So I started like, you know, so that was like I think my transition into like you know the the, the, the jazz realm as far as harmonically and chords were going and stuff and movement and stuff. So I um uh, when I was in eighth grade, um, I remember going to see the local public high school where I ended up going. Um, they had a really great jazz program there, and it was a really young director, uh, music director there, and. Um, so I ended up going uh, between my eighth and ninth grade because I did, did, did decide to go to public school because I went to Catholic school growing to eighth grade, um, just specifically for the jazz program. But to find out that they didn't take freshmen in the jazz band, it was like mm -hmm. it was 11th and 12th grade. But so I would go and audition and uh, did my thing, played some classical, played some ragtime. And then he put a jazz chart in front of me or just a chord chart. And he says, can you read this? And I'm like, I have no idea what this is, you know. Uh. Just chords only. It was there's no notes. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. it, you know, so it all basically started from that. But I mean, I kind of caught on quickly, and uh, so then I really got really into jazz. But it's, at the time, it was more like big band jazz. You know, that was, you mm -hmm. know what I was being introduced to. But yet he was turning me on to all kinds of stuff with the Herbies and the Chick Coreas and Keith Jarrett and all, all the way back to the, you know all the traditional bebop stuff. So I studied really, you know, a lot just on my own. Had the Jamie Abersall records. I used to mess yeah. with those, you know, those. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Music minus one. <laughs> Absolutely. So yep. that, was, that was basically once in the, and, and all of a sudden I, I got accepted into the jazz band as a freshman. So, nice. Uh, yeah. So as a like, freshman. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so it was like I got my four, I got four years of this. And um, even oh, after cool. like during that first year, I mean, I was, I think I was learning pretty fast and uh, we had a really great bass player and drummer in the band. Um, and uh, the band directors started like uh, hiring us for like weddings or casuals. Casuals. So, I, you, know, and I, you know, here I was like, like 13 and I'm starting to get some checks for some gigs. I was like, you know, <laughs> it's hell yeah, yeah, man. Like, you know, it wasn't much, but I mean, but it did like, you know, um, <clears throat> give me a taste of that. I was like, hmm, I kind of, I kind of like this, you know, and uh, I think it was probably good on him too. He, because he probably made a little more money. But <laughs> sure. <laughs> By paying yeah, he doesn't have to pay a 13 year old. We're, we're, yeah. we're loving it, you know? So and it just kind of, it went, it went from there. And then like by the 10th grade, next thing you know, I was playing in the big bands of, at the local uh, community colleges, uh, it's college of San Mateo, actually where Phil Lesh went. And I, I did, I went there for like a semester myself and uh skyline college. So I was playing like Monday nights in uh, college of San Mateo, Tuesday nights at uh, skyline, but playing with all all like the best working musicians in town because they didn't have you know the horn players didn't have the gigs on Mondays or Tuesday nights. Yeah, I was being introduced to all these players and, and still and some of these guys are still friends to date to, to this day and you know that awesome. kind of just didn't just kind of went like that. And, what year? Uh, what year was that? Like around your freshman year? Like what was? Um, that would have been in '82. Okay. 
All right, cool. So I graduated in 86. And then by the time, by 1988, um, I kind of was uh, through a mutual friend. Uh, he took me to the jazz workshop, which we had reopened, which was a legendary jazz workshop in San Francisco, mm-hmm. back from the Miles and Coltrane, all those guys that yep. everybody played there. So that place opened up again and they were having these jam sessions. So he took me there. I'm 18 years old. Brought me in the one time, made some introductions, and then he's like, you're on your own now. A little slap in the back, you know? So <laughs> Get out there and be somebody. <laughs> I just kept going there, you know? Then all of a sudden, he took me in, like, family, and I was like, you know, I'm jamming all the time, and then then started getting calls for gigs, um, even gigs there. And until I think I was maybe, I want to say, in, I don't know, 19 or 20, um, walking into the club for, for a gig, and all of a sudden, the, the doorman, which I knew, and he, all of a sudden, he just, like, went, stop, like, I'm sorry, Jeff. Um, someone came in off the street and said that you were under 21. <laughs> oh man! What? And I couldn't do the gig, <laughs> and so I couldn't go back in there. And I was like, "Oh shit! You know what am I gonna do? You know, I've been I've been having fun. You know, I'm drinking there and all that stuff." <laughs> <laughs> we well, have you on videotape. Oh, well, well, <laughs> wait, 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 someone from the street came in and said that you. That's, were- a, that's what they said. I don't know. But, you know yeah. Actually, it's sadly to say that place ended up getting shut down because they were basically operating under tax evasion. So well, karma's a boomerang. So they should have just let you in. They'd still be open. Well, who knows, you know, <laughs> but then shortly after that's when I got that, I ended up getting the, the tour with En Vogue, which was like brought me in a completely different direction. I had no idea. And uh, now didn't I hear somewhere, you've correct me if I'm wrong, but you and Kofi kind of crossed up somewhere back then those days, didn't you? Because he was uh, playing with After Seven and some other, it was like the, on the R&B what year was that? Well, I mean, see, I, I was on the. Uh, it was the. Their, it was their very first tour um, with MC Hammer. Yes, because that's where it is. Because Kofi, that tour was with MC Hammer. But I'm saying also, it, was, it was different legs, though, because uh, the one yeah. I was on uh, had Vanilla Ice on it. Jesus, really? Yeah. And then, there, then um, <clears throat> I think the After Seven came la- later after, on. It might have been, it might have been after because <sighs> I uh, I did it. It was like a four month tour. It was like six nights a week. But it was all arenas, yeah. so I was like, like my first foyer into tour bus life and arena yeah. gigs. And um, that was. But I realized at the same time because it was basically it was like four keyboardists and, and, a, and a drummer. So uh, I'm playing a lot of samples, you know. Yeah. Stuff like that. Maybe I played a bass line on a tune here or there, you know. But it was mostly samples. And then by the time I came back to try to come back to jazz gigs, I was like, oh my god, man, my shit's not working anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a click. Track. You know, I just wasn't playing, playing, you know. But it was, but it, I. I was learning a different craft part of it, you know, so everything's always been positive. I never looked at anything like that was negative. You know, I just figured everything was part of the steps along the way. Yeah. You just learn how to throw knuckleballs well, instead of fastballs. Yeah. <laughs> uh, real, real quick about that tour. If you don't mind me asking, where did, where did in Vogue fall in the line in the, was that MC hammer headlining the tour? Oh, yeah, or did, definitely. So you yeah, guys, his, you his tour was like about a year and a half long. Uh huh. <coughs> So he, but he did have like, you know, um, you know, he always he always had like the the inner acts uh, that he had was part of his entourage on stage. And so it was like there's multiple little small groups that became, you know, a fame on their own mm-hmm. uh, through that. Um, I remember like one time uh, I was on the ended up being on the bus with the uh, hammers you know, entourage and we pulled up to a hotel and there was these like four guys were outside the hotel, like dancing like crazy. Next thing you know, I, they're on the tour. <laughs> like street, they like street street audition for him. They're on the tour. Next thing you know, they they're on this McDonald's commercial. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, man! I was like, this crazy. Holy see cow! Okay, you know, okay. you know. Right that's on. great. They knew they were coming to audition. Yeah, they're like, totally. here comes the bus. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, my, I, I think my my first recollection with Kofi was uh, was early on with the um, Rat Dog and Derek Trucks like co billing and stuff. Yeah. And I just remember seeing Kofi play and I was like, oh my God, this I gotta like I gotta be like this guy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he was so incredible, man. And uh, you know, I just still my heart's out there, man. It's just everything I know is it's thank helpful. you. I appreciate you know? it's funny, I'm starting to feel most of that I feel like now. It's like all coming out now. Oh sure. I uh, just like, you know, right before we did these gigs, I, I went through about a two week period where I was just like crying like five times a day, you know, yeah, but I was also working on singing these tunes. So it's, it was helpful, but yeah, no, Kofi was just one of those cats, man. Like I, I, I think about those old days a lot now. It's just like, you know, 
if he if either of us could have known like where this was going to end up, we would have been like, no, really? Are you, <laughs> you know, it's like right with you. Yeah. But yeah, you- the memories come, you know, they, they come back in, in, in spurts and it's always the good. It's always good stuff. And or I even find like, you know, um, you know, more like say for, I haven't lost my any of my siblings, but like my I lost my parents early on kind of. So it's like, you know, you, they come in dreams and stuff where it's like and it's actually you feel like uh like I feel like I had closure and you feel satisfied and it's, it's like, I can kind of consider it more like a visitation yeah. rather than a dream, you know, and it's, uh, it's just really, it's, it's just a really good feeling, you know? And so the, at least you have that to hang on to through the rest of your life, you know? And so, yeah, I did. I got one visit from him. It was crazy. Cause I was so jealous. Everybody else was having these dreams about him, you know, just uh, semi regularly dream about him. I was like, wow, man, you know, like I'm your boy. (laughs) uh, But when I was in India, when we were getting Kavi, and it was like right at the close of this Star Trek episode that I finally got back into. uh, And me and Kofi were really into that in the old days. And I kind of left it behind. And then he came to me in this dream and it just walked up this deck. And I was like, oh, my God, is it you? He's like, yeah, man, it's me. I was like, really? And I hugged him. I could actually feel his body. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I woke up just in tears. I called my sister. And I was like, it was a great time, too. Like, it was such a meaningful time in India, you know, and a sure. really intense time. Oh, I bet. And it just, like, all came together. And I do, like, I, if I never dream of him again, I, I really will remember it. To, on my last day, oh, I know the, the, the whole do. tangible feeling is it's it's incredible, you know. And like I said, it's just like cause I I didn't really have closure with my father, you know, because I was probably about thirty or thirty when he passed away, and um, <clears throat> so it was just like he was just starting to like you know open up to me more as an adult, you know, in a sense where you like you know, and I was looking forward to hearing some old stories, all that stuff, and I never got it. My brother had it, yeah. you know. So, mm-hmm. like I said, the dreams have helped me, like you know, kind of like oh, now I feel like you know there was closure there, and it's it's really it's really comforting. That's all I can say. Do you feel like it helps the music? Because I tell you, man, like I've been working. I tried to sing Morning Dew one time with my band, and I, and I tried to sing Standing on the Moon with Melman, mm-hmm. and it just didn't work. Like I didn't have the, what? It's just that well, binary. I don't, I, I don't believe you for one no, minute. Even <laughs> Melvin, no, even Melvin. I was like Melvin. I just don't feel like I could do it. And Melvin was like, "Yeah, it's not." <laughs> I mean, it didn't hurt my feelings. It just it was obvious. It wasn't there. And then this last time, I've been working on Morning Dew on mm-hmm. my piano, the acoustic piano at the house, and then I just cry. I literally five times a day. I play Morning Dew again, and I feel like. All the experience and the people passing, Colonel Bruce, Kofi, everybody else, you know, um, it gets you to a certain point, just an age and experience where like now I can do it. You feel that like when we're playing China Doll and whatever, those oh, sure. those ballads, like you just mm-hmm. have to live long enough a little bit and feel some of those. Well, go definitely those it's things. like you got to have the experience and being seasoned or whatever. And then life experiences, I think, that go into it as you get older, you realize some more of that stuff. Because, I mean, it's early on, like people might tell you something like, oh, you know, something musically that might be uh, some some way for you to learn something or something for you to think about where it's like it just doesn't make sense. You know, yeah, and then yeah. years later, you could just be walking down the street. All of a sudden, it's like, bam, it's like that's what that was, you know? And then you feel like you made some growth, you know? And I think that's, you know, and the music, especially in ballads, because you're so exposed. I mean, that's, you want to test, you want to test somebody's skill, make them, you know, play a ballad, you know? Is yeah. That, it's funny. Yeah. That's my favorite thing to play with you. Uh, and, and that's always, my guitar player used to say, ah, adult tempos, Mark Kimball, because he liked that separate, it's it's the harder thing to do, and I feel like that's one of your, you know, top three strong points, maybe top two. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, it's also you, you can't be afraid to um, <clears throat> expose yourself. Not, not, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, you know, and you got to lay your emotions on the line, and you know, let the feminine side out, and then it's you know, it's all good, you know, and it's it, but it's such a like such a great feeling. I mean, when it's and then just having the space in there and everything just breathes and yeah you know and it's just and and both of you guys coming from that like you know 
being able to listen to Jerry like creakily sing those tunes and how much experience with loss he had yeah at such an early age Man, it yeah. kills me now where like i i when i was younger i was like oh no wonder you didn't get it when you're younger i guess you just weren't evolved really but now just like every creak every fragility in his voice is just like oh yes you know because now that the pain that i've been through i just yeah. I'm like it's you know it's very healing for me to listen to it what's well, funny as a listener too because like i think like <laughs> listening to the Grateful Dead so much of my life, I remember like I went through that, like, you know, the pig pen phase and the, you know, like the, the big arena, fa- you know, the, the throwing yeah. stones and the big loud, you know, and then mission in the rain was a song. I, I, it just didn't catch me early on. I think I was too young to get it. And then you spend some time alone and you spend some time getting your, you know, shit kicked in a little bit. And then you listen to that and it's, Wow. That's then how those, high those, time was for me. Because yeah. Jeff, a, a bunch of people told me, man, you should really sing high time. And then I, and I made a playlist, like everything and everybody ever suggested, I put it on this playlist and I listened, it just didn't hit me. And then Jeff, when you, when you said, you were like, man, high time. So I was like, dude, just learn it. Just don't listen yeah. to it and think how you feel about it. Just learn it. So I learned it for two months it was stuck in my head in a good way and remember i think i texted i was like man i see what you were saying about that song (laughs) (laughs) and now it's like my favorite man kofi played that tune before he passed away there's a tape of him taking his flutes on high time it's just oh oh my god wow the crowd goes and i just and i look back on the lyrics of that song now Mm -hmm. i'm having a hard time living the good life just like oh yeah I think I remember I was, uh, I mean, maybe like we you didn't, we didn't perform it or you didn't sing it uh, publicly, but I think it was like maybe a, a month or two period. But I think, I think I remember us being like in a, in a, on one of our dressing rooms and we were just working on it. Yeah. The two Asked of you us to play it with me. Yeah. And then, uh, then, then it brought it into the live show not too long after that, you know, but it's, uh, yeah. That was the first time Bob ever handed me off a song. He wanted to do it, remember, and have us split it and mm. alternate verses. And then later on, he was like, man, you go ahead and take it. And I was wow. like, you want me to sing the whole thing? He's like, yeah. I was like, nice. wow. I, really, I've, I feel like it was a moment of, uh, I don't know, I felt the paternal approval, you know. like, sure. yeah. but, You know, it was like, it was hey, cool. He threw you the keys. He's like, yeah, 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 take the car. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't crash. I'm watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you kill all those songs, man. I, no, I, you're the, yeah. I, I wonder how much of that's just come from your jazz background or just from you. Like, Because when you said like not being afraid of your feminine side, I think that's a huge key with it. It's a huge key to jazz drumming that people, uh, certain people struggle with, no, certain drummers struggle with, you know? I've never, uh, I've never been shy about it myself and, you know, but I definitely like from all my life and just uh, the way I always approach playing was like, I'm, I'm always coming from the inside. So it's nothing, you know, and it's, and uh, I'm not, af- like I said, not afraid of the, of the emotion and, you know, it's like I said, it is scary sometimes, but it's, but I like the yeah. challenge, you know? And, yeah. But if you're not going to put it out there genuinely, I just want them why do it. You know? We, you know what else too? Like when you tap into that, it's almost, you're like a good exhausted Oh yeah. When you're done, yeah. you know, there's an exhaustion of holding it in that makes you like a stressed tired, but when sure. you're able to completely like cut your veins and just let it like that's a good you feel like like I love that elated. feeling. You know, I do that. too, like what <sighs> Yeah. You know, you're exhausted, <laughs> you know, but but for good reason, you know. Yeah, it's, exactly. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a really satisfying uh, exhaustion. It's been I weird. I think it'll give you cancer if you don't get it out too. Like you're supposed to move it out because oh, sure. the stressed, exhausted then works on a tumor or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's like, like that. That's like that great Bill Burr joke where he's like, you die at like 58 because you couldn't admit a puppy was cute. You know, like you're just, you're just pushing it down. You know, it's true though. It is, man. Yeah, <laughs> we're really blessed to have that outlet to be able to release it too. You know. Well, and, and it's true too, like when you think about like, I'll take Fare Thee Well, for instance, like as an example, where it re- literally transcended all age groups. I mean, you had teenage, you had young, young kids there with their parents. And then you had, I watched people who hadn't seen themselves since like 81 tour recognize each other and hug and cry. And it, I mean, it was yeah. just the most amazing thing. And you could see people 
literally just like cradling themselves, holding themselves and just bawling. And you could just, if you looked hard enough, you could see the memories. Just everyone was having those moments where they were just letting it all out as you guys were. And, and I was bawling with them too. And it was weird songs. Crazy fingers was a song that I used to sit on the roof of my house when I would get home and just play it over and over and over and over again, the studio one. And, and it was just the most pretty song. And I thought Jerry was just such like that singing was so great on the, you know, and then when you, when you guys did that at first, I mean, I was just like, it all just came gushing out of me, man. Like it was like uncontrollable. And it was like watching little geysers go off across all the soldier oh, yeah. field. You, know? and, and you could feel that on stage too, because it was just such a powerful, uh, you know, <sighs> run of shows to where it was just like, Whoa. Okay. You know, like this. Yeah. It's Everything's quite, perfect. You know, I don't really have arm hair, but it, it, it was standing. Mine's standing up. Mine's standing <laughs> up for both of us. <laughs> I often think about that, like with you, Jeff, because you've been through so many eras of this. You know, I think of the lineup. So it started with Rat Dog. And then what was it after I mean, right that? Right, right. I mean, there was, there was some fill in friends stuff right away. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then it just carried carried through or to where it was like whatever if he, if he even was one off gigs or whatever it was something maybe mickey was involved with maybe something that billy mm-hmm. might have been involved with and then it um and then when it came down to uh them wanting to uh do uh the dead with the with the core four which was uh oh two then i got the call for yeah. that so so then just from and from that point no matter what it just like kept going and, and whatever offshoots it seemed like i was involved with for most of it and so they put well, me around but could I even take a step further back? How did it, how did it, the introduction begin with you and, and the Grateful Dead? Like, was it, you know, obviously I San Francisco. That was your O'Teal's original question, which I probably went off in the, uh, the wrong. <laughs> the, the wrong <laughs> no, 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 no. To, yeah, please. That's circle. why we're here. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was playing with a uh, um, great saxophone. This guy, uh, Dave Ellis, uh-huh. um, local who actually, we both were in high school at the same time period. So we used to always be at these, uh, opposing jazz festivals you know i remember him from high school <laughs> dueling you know, fest. he went to berkeley high and i went to south city high but and, and kenny brooks was another guy he was at el cerrito high um so some of these guys that you know i didn't see them for you know 20 years and then uh, we're playing together but anyway fast forward or rewind um i was uh in dave ellis's jazz quartet and he had just gotten a gig with rat dog I knew uh, I knew Jay already because I had done some subbing um, for my friend Red Scott and uh, their hip hop band with Jay that founded um, or co-founded um, Alphabet Soup. Yeah. So I knew Jay a little bit through that, and, but I knew Jay was also playing in Rat Dog. But anyway, Dave had um, <clears throat> mentioned me to um, Bob, and I remember this is like right around New Year's time, and um, that would have been '97 in January, and. Uh, so I guess they met, made mention to Bob because Johnny Johnson was playing in the band at the time. Yeah. So it was just, but it was kind of, my understanding was that, you know, he was kind of phasing out from like, he was doing what, you know, not wanting to go on the road basically. So they needed somebody and obviously somebody local um, was to their advantage too. So like I said, they, they made a mention and to Bob and like within two days later, I get a phone call and said, Hey, you know, they want you to come up and do an audition. So I'm like, really? I was like, okay. And I, you know, at this point, I'm I'm now engaged to be married. I'm thinking like, Jesus, like, you know, I got, you know, I got, could be a good gig to help me too, you know. And it's just, uh, <laughs> so, but that was like January, and then so from that point, I started going up to Bob's house, and like everybody was getting together. And, and in fact, the very first day I went up there, was, we're all sitting around outside in his deck, and. So it's like, okay, let's let's go jam, you know, and go in and all of a sudden the, the power went out. I'm like, shit. So it was like, Here's Jerry showed up. Yeah, something. So we sat around for like hours there talking, you know, and then we were getting ready to leave, and it was like power came back on. And so it was like, okay, let's let's quickly play a little bit. So we played a little bit, but anyway, I just like was going up a couple, two or three days a week, whatever, getting together, and and some months went by, you know, and I never asked anything and um and I was never being told anything. <laughs> but I'm like, okay, I know they got these, they got these you know, and, and I knew that the, the big summer, the, um, the further festival was coming up. Yeah. So that. I was like, okay, is that the target? I don't know. But anyway, I think what it might have been like, uh, 
maybe April or to May, early May or something, where it was, uh, I might've ended up doing finally my, my first gig with Rat Dog. But it was, the funny thing was I was, I actually called Bob cause I, I just, I didn't know anything. I'm like, I, I need to know. Cause it's like, I'm, I got book gigs or not or whatever, you know? <laughs> and uh, he was like, well, you know, I'm in, and granted all this, I, I actually knock, I would have never really hustled for a gig in my life. Stuff yeah. just like kind of came. So, but here it was like, uh, I call him, we're talking and he's like, and I just said, yeah, I'm just trying to get a feel of what's going on. He's like, well, I don't know. I can't really say anything. You know, I'm like, <laughs> so I was like, I'll tell you what I said, I really need this gig and you need me on this gig. And that's all I said. And he was like, fair enough. You know? <laughs> and, and then within probably like, I finally got the word, you know, so. Amazing. But for me, I, I, was, I was just almost like shit my pants. Like I just said that to Bob. And you're like, you know, like. Hey, Bob, listen, man. Yeah. You just rolled it. You Donna Jean to him. He did like yeah, the I, Jedi I, Donna were, Jean trick. Yeah, totally. Just said, I'm, I, you know, I, I got your back, bro. I'm here for you. you know? so, <laughs> and here we are, 23, almost 24 years later. Yeah. Wow. That's great. <laughs> what a great story, man. I love it. That's so awesome. It's just so funny when you look at the evolution of things, because I think when you get when you get to, uh, older, <laughs> let's just say it is what it is, and you can look back, you know, because as you talk about what was happening, I'm like tracking where I was oh, sure. at that time. I was just so young and crazy. Oh, my goodness, you know. Well, first, by I, the heard, time- first I heard you really was, uh, <clears throat> would have been uh, through Jimmy Herring, is it? You guys had done some recording or whatever, and it was, you know, and it was, I think it might have been his stuff or whatever. It was, it was. his record, yeah, with Kofi, and he yeah. Playing some of it, I was like, oh my God. And I was like, who is this bass player? You know, and he's like, oh, it's Othiel Burbridge. I was like, really? And I was like, Jesus Christ, I got to play with this guy, you know? <laughs> I was blown away. I was like, you know, by, by the whole recording too, and I think it might it might have been like a Jason Crosby record that you guys also did together too. That I might have heard yep. some stuff on. Well, that's what's so funny because uh, I just did a gig with Jason Crosby over the weekend. Oh, nice! He came down here to Miami, played with my trio, and so um, we were playing some certain things and it was just he has that very beautiful sense of music like yeah. you and it just made me think of you so much and then now we're podcasting with you today <laughs> yeah, you know, know. I'm just like ah <laughs> this is <laughs> great but yeah he had some we had such a good time over the weekend again I love the you know Tom Guarn is a jazz player Pete's a jazz player. Jason just has a, I love that sensibility with this music. Cause those, the, man, those tunes are just right for it. Stella Blue, yeah. you know, it's some the structure of these things. Mayer said it. He's like, you know, they're, it's like, they're like real book tunes. Like you yeah. have to solo over these mm. changes and stuff, you know? And, um, it's not yeah. easy, you know, and, I, and I, I, I learned that early on too. Cause where I was like, wow, okay, you really got to create something within, a, within a limited scope of, of a harmonic realm you know because it's like you know yeah the jazz chords you can have all these substitute chords and you know, and, and, you know along with the traditional movements but the stuff the stuff was you know chords would be moving by so it's like oh yeah but now when you get say you got one chord what yes. do you do you know mm. yes it's like wow it's like it's this it, it's not easy so. can you be musical yeah, yeah it's a different it's kind a, of math <clears throat> it's a We're, different challenge it's like a challenge and all the most challenges are like that. There has some limitations set up for you. Now you got to work over to overcome that. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. And so for a jazz player, no chords. We get one chord. <laughs> Go thirty minutes. Yeah, see in a half <laughs> hour. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you well, do it great. <laughs> you know, Jeff. I wonder about this too because it's like something that with OT, like, did you ever have a job other than playing music? <laughs> Not really a. No, yes and no. I guess I will say I, my first. Uh, let me think back here. Okay, I worked in a uh, in a woman's clothes warehouse um, that it was that would stock like Macy's and all these in Nordstrom or whatever. Yeah, I think I was probably going into ninth grade. Um, <laughs> I think I worked there for like a month or just for the summer, I guess. <laughs> There's your French so, bakery, like, Otil. So it was like my my, my first. Job. They basically put it, made, gave me a job just for, there was no job there, but it was, my first gig was like, sweep this entire 10,000 square foot warehouse floor. 
What's a broom? You know. So, I think I'll go play music. Yeah. So I did that, and then um, my sophomore year, I ended up getting a uh, like a under the table gig at this local uh, deli that was like the first one that had the big sub sandwiches in town, nice. and they're still there and still quite popular. But I, I did that for a little while, um, and then I sold golf clubs for a few years. Wow. Is that I, I, what hooked you on the golf or were you already hooked? I was, hooked already, on the I golf was already hooked, you know, and it just kind yeah. of How did that start? I'm interested well, in mutual, that story. A mutual friend that I grew up with had, had been working at this particular store and um and he told me that he was getting ready to quit and he said, Hey, they you know, they want to get somebody, you know, and you have golf. He figured I played golf, so I knew a little bit about golf and they needed a you know, a golf club in store salesman. So I ended up getting that gig. I did it like, yeah, you know, from about like eighteen to like I did it up until the end Vogue tour. And I think I came back and did it a couple more months after that. And then, then I was just done. I just said, I got just, it was all it. Music <laughs> so who got you into the golf? Is that your dad or just, uh, I mean, well, he used to, I was would, like, when I was young, I mean, he would watch it on TV and I just like, was fascinated by it. And then by the time I was, I think I was 12, he took me to the driving range for the first time. So, and I was a baseball player. So and, and I think pretty good at it, but, um, I played baseball up until college age and then that was it. But, um, but yeah, driving range at about 12. And then when I first, the first time I really struck the golf ball the right way once it was like, Oh my God, that was the feeling. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I literally nice. like, you know, I just started like having him like summertime or whatever, like drop me off in the morning at the, at the range. And you come back in the afternoon and pick me up and I would just spend all day there, you know, that's cool. Balls that's awesome. and it kept me out of trouble. Yep. And uh, then when I got into high school, uh, I also played on the golf team because um, baseball practiced every day and I just I had music going on. So golf allows you to practice on your own. Plus, you got to play with these these all these great courses around here. And and uh, it was just great. So. Were you were you so. All right. I, when I, I played baseball and football my whole like childhood, you know, and then I broke my humerus bone snowboarding and mm. I had to get a plate and stuff put in. And what the doctor said was for, to break up the scar tissue, he goes, do you golf? And I'm like, no, but I will. And he's like, well, you got it swinging a club. That motion is perfect for breaking up the scar that tissue. It. Right. Yeah, so I would go walk nine holes at this local <laughs> place and I would listen to like, you know, an entire set of a dead show, or I'd listen to, I found albums that would match like the whole Moe's Wormwood album. Would, <laughs> yeah. Just smoke and then go play. And, but I liked, um, like, I want to ask you from a musician standpoint, do you play golf quiet? Like if you're out alone, do you ever like listen to anything or do you like the silence and the meditation of the golf? Like listening to music while I'm playing. Yeah, I like no, listening I to don't. music and playing I golf. No, I mean I'm, no. I'm I'm in the like I just I love the, just the quiet of it. The and birds and the trees and the wind. I'm, I'm a walker, so it's like you know it's like carrying my bag and I walk and that's that's like kind of like my, my my therapy. But oddly enough, what you're talking about with that kind of motion, I find that like you know it, it's a good balance with uh, against music because a there's like similar mindset and frame that you know um, yeah. with golf and music. But the motion of it also releases the the mu tension in the in the muscles that you know you can get playing your instrument. Yeah. So I find it's like oh, okay that that kind of releases that and it's, then it's loose when it come back to play. So I think it kind of helps each other out. You know, and I've also found ways because I had you know I've had tendonitis problems over the years or whatever, and I found I could fling and pop my elbow. You know, all of a sudden <laughs> just like like popping cracking your knuckles. You know, and then all of a sudden you go. <laughs> Oh, like opens up the channels, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> it's like yeah, you're trying that. No, I know it, it's weird. You got to get it just right, but it, it feels all of a sudden it's just like ah, you know, it feels Ooh. good. So, but golf is definitely like a muscular release, you know, from you know from the music side. But it's just for me, it's just being outdoors and being in the zone. You, yeah, you, you just try to hit that one good shot around, even. But you know, but if you're walking and carrying, so I got thirty pounds on my back. I'm not a gym guy. But I'm walking between, you know, between anywhere five, six, seven miles in one shot. You know, great. a couple yeah, weeks ago, I, actually did, I did. I walked 36 in uh, two different courses, um, well, 18 one course bag. and 18 the other course, which the second course was actually had some, it's um, it was at Olympic Club, which 
the, the where they play the U.S. Open, and you can't tell the elevations on this on the the last few well, holes of this course. But I mean, you're walking up the side of a mountain, and then once you finish that, you got to walk up more of a mountain to get back up to the like street level. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, I was like, oh my god! So that was like a good 12, 13 miles of, with clubs on my back, and but I made it. I was I was okay. Nice. You know, like, nice. I, feel, I feel like I'm still in shape. It was good. That's as good as any gym workout. Oh, dude. Yeah. Those are muscles you can use too. You know what I mean? Like you you go to the gym and you just build up mass. These are muscles that you can, you know, use the rest of your life carrying the weight around. You need to keep moving for sure. Hell yeah. I I have a question for you about these, um, these shows recently with Bobby and Mm -hmm. the Wolf Bros and stuff. I'm loving the diversity of the tunes that are being played. I'm noticing a lot of stuff he's pulling out of, you know, like the weather reports and the, there seems like there's a lot of good energy and a unique take on a lot of these tunes. I really love this lineup. It's been really fun. I mean, it's like, you know, and like I said, it just didn't know going into what to expect. And it was basically, um, I had originally just gone, it was, uh, you know, Don was had asked, like, he said, hey, you know, could you come up and just want to, you know, just play some of the stuff. And so it was just the four of us doing it. And then shortly after that, he's like, uh, had I heard of this uh, this guy, pedal steel player, Greg Lease? And I was like, yeah, he's great. And then so that's then there was the five piece, you know, and then um, I know it's maybe a little premature. I think I could talk about it because I think there's some eventual plan that they were uh, there might have been some. Um, idea to do some uh, like a symphony kind of <clears throat> tour wow with wolf brothers itself and so now i think that morphed into the five pieces but then with that they also wanted to have like these soloists per se that would play with the orchestra can play the orchestra parts but it would also be the improvisers of the orchestra with the prospective instruments so that's how it ended up being the you know you got cello you got violin you got trombone you got trumpet and saxophone Nice. So, it sounds so cowboy classical. Like it really is. Cool. And, and, and they're all great. They're all great players. And then um, <laughs> one in particular, I used to play in his his original music band twenty before getting into Rad Dog. So I hadn't seen him in a really long time. So it was nice. You know, it was like kind of a homecoming. Like, oh my god, it's like that's ah, you're, you're great. And you know, yeah. So it's just uh, it's, it's been good. You know, and like, it's growing. And um, so we'll just see where it goes. I feel like the whole thing that Bobby did with like the national and mm-hmm. then that whole like dead tribute double album or whatever, you know, that came out kind of like all the modern band. Well, everybody really, there was a ton of people that put stuff out on that, but it just, it, it put a nice shot in the arm of like dead tunes taking on a complete life of their own in a whole different format, key Ooh. phrasing, you know, hearing them do lost sailor saint with like this lineup and it dipping into yeah. like, you know, nice valleys and the pedal steel and the ho- like muffled horns. It's, it's just really, really like, it just seems like Bob it's, it's a great pocket for these yeah. tunes that for Bobby to kind of lead and orchestrate. Yeah. No, and he's, and he's always constantly since I've, you know, known him. I mean, he's always trying to push the envelope. He wants to push stuff forward. And, you know, sometimes it may sound like, well, this is a crazy idea, but there's always a method to the madness and and, and, it, and it makes sense after a while. And it might be one of those things where it's like, I wasn't ready to realize it yet. And I realized it later on what he's actually talking about. It's like, oh, God, that's brilliant. You know, or, you know what I'm saying? And, but this is also, you know, it's about, you know, it's, it's given him all the space that he that he needs and let him express. And, you know, it's about the song, um, you know, so um, you just got to play to the music and how it's going, you know, and where it wants to go. And like, even the other night, we, I think some stuff took off in the other one where it was like, wow, that, that was kind of interesting. Like it went that way where, you know, <laughs> in the, and never did that way, but, you know, but just, you know, you don't expect anything. You don't, you, you know, there's nothing, no expect, expectations going into it. You just right. leave it open, let the palette be blank and, you know, but I do, I mean, I know Teal is saying we, we do that with every gig. Right. So, and just got But I, d- I do like Bob when it's quieter and when there's more, sp- like he really, <clears throat> he just means it so much, man. Yeah. You know, like when he's, and when he has that space to like put it forward dramatically the way he wants to. Yeah. Uh, it's really powerful. It's yeah. really powerful. You know, he 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 joined us on the podcast. Uh, he was one of our first guests, and he talked mm. about how when he's singing these tunes, he becomes the character 
in the song. Like he's singing as like the the hitchhiker in Black Throated Wind, or sure. he's singing as like the broken hearted, you know, like and it's and yeah. you could tell it. And you could tell like, you know, and you, from him saying that, and then you go back and watch or watch him now, and it's like he totally takes on the yeah. character of the song. It's opera is what it is. Yeah. It really is, yeah. <laughs> you know? But you have to do that. I mean, it's like, you know. You have to. Uh, that's that's like what you were saying. It's like cutting it, the veins know? and letting it bleed out. Yeah, you have to leave it all. Yeah. Leave it all out there. And he's got a lot of lived experience, man. It's like, it's... It's really something. That, that's why I'm so glad to get to talk to people. This podcast has been so amazing, man, to just yeah. really talk to people and hear. It's, it's different from reading it in a book. Sure. You know, you know well, I'm, like I'm, to, I'm honored to be a part of the, the series. So thank you for having oh, me. Thank uh, you. you know. Well, man, I mean, you're such a part of the story between Rat Dog Further, The Dead, Grateful Dead 50. I mean, you know, like. There's so much you've been and and everything else in between because I'm sure there's all the like you say there's all these little things you get the benefit, I mean, benefit gigs you'll never hear about it or yeah. in a sense or something you know or whatever you know so. well, I love that though Bob and Phil both like they're always going like I you know mm. Phil's like 81 I mean what can you say you know <laughs> yeah. they're just as youthful as ever and it's and it's it's really inspiring. Well, you know, def- we uh, we were doing King Solomon's Marbles, and we tried to figure out this one chord. And I said, Crosby, what is that chord in that song? He said, man, he called uh, Phil and Graham, and so they sent us the chart. And I sent it to uh, Tom, uh-huh. and he said, man, I don't know if this chart's going to be able to help us. It was like chicken <laughs> scratched out. But, you know, we were like trying to figure out this chord, and I, I figured out what I thought it was. And then Jason said, hey, man, Phil – is really psyched that you're doing this tune, and he actually asked if we could send him a copy of it. Oh, sweet. Yeah. And I was like, wow, it could make me feel good. But yeah, it's like, you know, Family, 81, man. he's still like, you know. Oh, I know. It's, it's just day. great, man. Could have called me. I mean, maybe I could have helped you. <laughs> you know, well, you're the guy, I, right? I was going to, man, I because I know. <laughs> It's that well, E, you know, it goes, it starts, the, it goes, da, 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 da. and so I'm playing like a B flat, Seven sharp nine over E. That's what I'm. Gotcha. Playing. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it sounds kind of whole tone, but then when I just played straight right, whole tone across it, it didn't work. It, not straight hold. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, that tune in particular is uh, uh, when I first heard that, and actually, I, th- I think that's one of my favorite studio albums too. Yeah, um, it's amazing. Just amazing the production, album. and that was done at Bob's house actually. Really? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. I think I remember hearing. Yeah, like the Christmas of like the music never stopped on that album. Yeah. Uh, yeah. God, it's But so when amazing. I heard King Song of Rumble, I was like, oh, my God. I was like, yeah. oh, is, these are the same guys here? Just, you know. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Great. Well, and, and not to, you know, O'Teal, I want to ask you a question while Jeff's here. Je- I've heard <laughs> Jeff mentioned as kind of being like the lighthouse or the beacon that when you're on stage, sometimes everybody looks like you kind of reel it in sometimes. Like he's the guy, huh? Every now and then is Jeff like the metronome in the band sort well, of? Well, Jeff, Jeff's the guy who we check everything if it's right or not. <laughs> <laughs> he's the oracle. When it, when I'm not there's... claiming anything, but it's a... No, but let's I'm, let's, I'm, let's I'm here be... to help if, I, if, if, if needed. I'll put it See, that he's way. like, I'm here to help. Yeah. Yeah, when you so need to humble. know if it's right or not. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because, you know, everybody's trying to remember. And, you know, how many different ways did they do it in different time periods? Yeah. And Jeff's the one that's like, well, it, you guys did do it that way this time. But, you know, the last time we did it, this is where it ended up. And that and that settles it. Yeah. He's the, <laughs> unless he's you ju- want to change it. it. Or, yeah, does it. You, or, or, you know, we, or we talk about something and then we get on stage and go to do it. <laughs> and it just goes completely <laughs> the other way, you know. Perfect. Just gone. You know, but that's okay, you know. And that's the, that's the, that's the beauty of it. You yeah. Know? Well, you know history. Really and that's what's too, important. It's yeah. Like, you know, it's like if you go in. I think you're going into. Uh, with preconceived notions or whatever, you just can't do it with this gig. Totally. This music, you know? And we don't or, want or, you or to. Really any music in a sense to me, at least music that I've played, you know, had the pleasure of playing all my life or just uh, been very lucky on that. So where it's like, it's not, it's not the same shit every night, you yeah. know, 
note for note even you know so it's like you know i don't know if i can survive on a on, a, on gigs like that you know hell no oh, no, no. the minute you get predictable history. i'm gonna stop buying tickets too because that's <laughs> we're there for the unpredictability so man we had a good one the other night i'm so glad it's on tape because we were doing gamora mm-hmm. and so gamora is kind of similar to like believe it or not like the intro right 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 just, da, 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 da. and my brain just couldn't Get it. So I went to Tom. I said, what are the first two notes of Gamora? You know, and he's like, B flat and F or whatever it was. I was like, okay, because I'm just lost right now. So then I played it. We started, I played it. Everybody was apparently had the same mind wipe at the same time. It's all on tape. <laughs> we tried four times. Da, da, oh, no. Da, da. Da, oh, well, that wasn't it. How about this? <laughs> da, da, oh, da, da, okay. Well, we got go two more. I don't know. No, never okay. hit it. And then when we hit the first note of Gamora, just a song, and it was all right. And I was like, uh, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> and so the, the guys told me the next day, I think Pete called, he said, I think we did the whole intro in E flat, and then we just switched to G. Wow. Hey. I was like, so it was just one of those things like, you can try to play this thing. <laughs> That's yeah. gonna just curveball you. I was like, I don't know whether that was Colonel Bruce or who was like, you know. I, I, and I, I have the same thing between those two. It's like, which one? Am, oh yeah, which one are we doing here? And uh, Althea and uh, Throwing Stones is another mm-hmm. one. Uh, that, and that B minor. At least the first four bars, you know, or whatever. <clears throat> there's a bridge too. There's a bridge in one song that's the same as another. They're just, you know, it's fine. They der- they're derivative or overlap, but sometimes the brain doesn't want to cooperate. <laughs> oh, I know. And I had it myself the other day. I was I was was talking about something about Stella Blue, but I I made reference to I was like, yeah, the bridge in War Frat, you know, and, and I said this chord, and then like people are looking at. Me. That chord's not in the bridge of Warfred. And I'm like, oh my God. I mean, it's just like, I just kind of, you know, it, it happens. <laughs> or it's like, you know, perfectly imperfect. Maybe the first song on the set list go, you know, here we go to count it off and somebody goes into a completely different song, you know. Like, what do you do at that moment? <laughs> just, That's the best part. I think it's that give and take with the fans too, though, that made it possible. Is, and a very unique fan base to that you can actually get away with this, you know. Yeah, and, and yeah. Much, much with with you on it. Yeah, as you, are, you know. Well, that's like, what the thing is that's so fun about like you know when I try to explain this to people who don't get it or people like I bring my I know when I started bringing my wife to shows and stuff I'm like we're gonna cheer more at the mistakes than we are at the perfection like we love the we love the whoops you know and like the band can look at each other and laugh and go like all right you know keep rolling and we're like cheering and you got like every, we want to hear yeah. it you know I think it gets to a point where we're like we just want to watch you guys practice you know what I mean? <laughs> well, and there's another are. side of the Yeah, <laughs> totally. That's how I look at it. Yeah. The show is just always going and it's like, you never, you know, but you get, the, you get the other side of the coin too, where it's like, you know, when the fans give you permission to mess up like that, you're more willing to take chances. And then because you keep taking more chances, sometimes you just hit a hole in one and everybody's like, ah, that's why oh, yeah. we keep waiting. Yeah. You know, because yeah. Yeah, well, incredible movie, golf you know. to tie it full circle, O'Teal, with the hole in one. <laughs> that reference was a hole in one, buddy. I'm waiting for the next one. I'm uh, <laughs> hey. a couple times over COVID, but uh, got three it's, so far. Nice. Yeah, I was going to say, you've had like three holes. I thought you had I've never, three I never saw any of them going. They were all blind holes for some reason. But um, Wow. I'd like to get back to playing again. That'd be a fun. Walking know, 36 okay. and carrying were, a bag. Uh, doing the, uh, the bike ride on the golf course. You're still doing that on daily basis no they 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 sh- they closed it off to well now if you're if you don't live in a neighborhood they won't let you do it so I got arthur you. can still do it they open the back nine from 6 30 a.m to 7 30 so then you could ride that because then it, it's going to take them a Offers while haven't to gotten there yet yeah yeah, yeah it's like now, tell fine. them where you're riding now you're riding among alligators and crocodiles and <laughs> <laughs> Je- Je- you got to send Jeff those pictures. He sent pictures <laughs> one morning of like, he's just riding on a trail and there's like, what, 10 foot gators like oh, at your, t- at the, yeah. They call it Shark Valley, but you go down there to ride and they're all in the road and stuff, you know, at a certain time of year, it's more, it's actually over now. Some friends just went and they like didn't see anything sure. hardly at all. Yeah. But when we were down there, they were 
big ones, man, and they're and all they're, over the place. Generally not going to mess with you, but it's uh, – I mean, it's like sharks and stuff. Like, you have to be dumb. If you could provoke them, yeah. But for the, I mean, you know, a place would have been closed down forever ago. Right. If, you know, a couple of people got eaten. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, saying, yeah. <laughs> but it is a little weird. We you just ride your yeah. bike. But there's one, there's one uh, down by the library here. And me and Arthur have biked like, 8,000 miles together, literally. And there's alligator warning signs like, don't bring dog no dogs allowed they could get yeah. eaten and i never saw it till the morning before we went to shark valley and i just yeah. saw his nose and his eyeballs and i was like is that it or is it a branch you know and then i went down to try to take a picture and he just ducked under the water i was like yes but they saw him and he had eaten something too and he was swollen up like i think he was at least like six feet long Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, I was playing golf in uh, Florida one time and it was going to, he would come into the 17th holes. It was generally 17th, so usually a par three and on average on your golf course. But right. so I'm, I was in the cart, but we're dri- I'm driving up and I'm probably about, I don't know, 80 yards away from the tee box. But I thought what I was seeing was like, it looked like wood panels that was like an elevated <laughs> tee box, you know? Mm. It was huge. I, I swear to God, this was, must have been like 14 feet or whatever. <laughs> I'm looking at this like, boy, it's a big log, you know? <laughs> And I drive up to this thing, and there was a crocodile. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I just stopped there. He kind of looked at me, and then he kind of, like, just kind of turned. And he went right into the water. Yeah. So, okay, T's clear. Put my peg in the ground, put the ball on there. I'm getting ready to hit all of a sudden. I look, and he rises up out of the water. and (laughs) He's chasing me, you know. And I'm just like, oh, God. (laughs) But... It was. I've never seen anything that big in my life. You know. Wow. Like, it's cool and because fast too. You know, it's uh, people think yeah, they, they could be. You'd be hard pressed to run away from one of them. But they can't turn. That's, that's what I. Yeah. yeah. That's the what I heard. Me. Remember that? What was that? Uh, Alan Alda, Peter Falk movie. Uh, brother, brother. No, what the hell was that? Classic movie. This. Um, I'll. I'll tell you later when i remember it but (laughs) serpentine was a very funny movie you gotta watch it well listen that's what it was was called in laws what the in laws i believe lord it's an old old one you know peter falk Falk i'll have to check that out for sure we're dating ourselves um, alan arkin sorry i'm gonna go to blockbuster and rent it tonight (laughs) (laughs) It's, it's pretty hilarious Dude, I can't wait to see you playing again, man. Thank you so much for hanging with us today. Yeah, well, it's been really great seeing you guys, and uh, it's been too long. But, I mean, I'm encouraged for the fact that, uh, um, you know, obviously Mexico has been announced. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, we got that, and I think uh, we're probably looking at some stuff maybe a little bit sooner, huh? Yeah, man, these vaccines are rolling. Fingers crossed. I go Wednesday for my second Pfizer dose. Really? Yeah, Stay hydrated. Finally. Stay hydrated. Oh, I, I, I drink a lot of water, so I'm not worried about it. I usually don't have reactions and stuff, but we'll see. You know, yeah, I know. After, yeah. Surprisingly, after the first one, I actually did the next day. I felt like in this weird kind of like tired days, even though I wasn't tired, but I just was kind of like just uh, I felt like I was just grasping for, you know, focus. Yeah, totally. And it was weird, you know. Yeah, it feels very hangover-ish, you know. Like, I think so, that was what <laughs> you guys had it easy. Mine feel like somebody poisoned That's me. That's what with you texted me. You, know, you go, I think I got poisoned. <laughs> just like, oh. no, but California wasn't really the greatest on, on the rollout here. So it's, uh, it's been, they've been catching up good. So it took me, I was trying early Such on, you know, thing, trying man. to get, you know. Well, you have so many people in California and yeah. we have so many old people here. That's why Florida was ahead because we just, it's, the old people got it first, you know. So, but we're and getting got, there, man. No, I know, I got, but they say the last six months, so we'll see. And then it's like, you'll probably have to do boosters after that. And maybe it becomes a yearly thing with uh, flu shots and COVID yeah. boosters, you know, so for a while, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, 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 wish, I wish we would ex- had, had expressed a little, uh, a little more patience early on in, in the whole thing, because I think we would have been a lot farther along, a lot faster. Had, Agreed. Had done so, you know, Agreed. we'd be back to seeing shows in full by now, you know, but it is what it is. Um, yeah. But we're all here and, you know, I'm glad to be able to share some of this time with you guys too. Please come hang with us again, man. Oh, and anytime. I would love to. Awesome. So. Thank you so much. Love you, man. Love you Thanks too. Thanks for listening, everyone. All right. See you guys. Peace. Talk to you soon. Okay. Later.